Hey everyone, welcome. I am Tim McDonald and you are here for the Community Manager Hangout that we do every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, we're also on Twitter. If you're following along, you can use the hashtag CMGR Hangout. Um, and we have Sherry Road over there, S-H-E-R-R-I-E-R-O-H-D-E. -R -R -E -E. She is on Twitter um, moderating getting the conversation going and keeping us all in line over there um, while I take care of things over on this end with uh, Bruce assistance. And today we have a very special guest. Um, and before we start, I just want to acknowledge the fact that we do know that there was a big shooting in um, Connecticut. For those of you that don't know, it's, it's breaking news. Um, you know, a couple people are all on Twitter and Facebook saying, Should it, is it appropriate to be posting anything if you're a brand? We're not a brand, we're a community, so if anybody wants to talk about that, you can feel free to, you know, to talk about that, but I just want to say, you know, it's a horrible thing that happened. Um, I, I always view situations that happen like this with, with a very heavy heart, but I also don't think that it should disrupt my life. Um, you know, I mean, we should all think about it, we should all talk about it, we should talk about the issues, but this isn't the forum that we talk about those things, you know, changing policies and gun control. That's not what Community Manager Hangout's about, so I didn't see any reason to, you know, to really put this on the back burner or not do it today. But I do want to let everybody know that we are considerate of it. We do know it's happening. It's not that we're immune to, to what's going on, and it's not that we're trying to ignore it by doing this. Um, so that being said, you know, uh, let's get into it. I, I have a very special guest today. Before we get into the introductions, um, I do want to say Mitch Jackson is, has become a friend of mine. I met him yeah. on a different live video platform, Spreecast. Um, when I was doing a lot of spree casting, Mitch still does a lot of spree casting, has a tremendous amount of guests, and he also happens to be an attorney out of Southern California, and he goes, are you sure you want to tell people I'm an attorney and, and that's why you're having <laughs> us on here, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, but I really see a lot of similarities um, in this. So, you know, before we get going in the introductions, um, Mitch, if you don't mind holding tight, we usually just do like a little, we do this community manager of the day and we have one every day. And so we're just going to kind of feature those people. Um, and while we're doing this, if everybody that's on the Hangout right now can go on Twitter and use that CMGR Hangout hashtag and just introduce yourself to everybody. Let them know that you're there. Um, let them know what's going on. That would be fantastic. Uh, let them know where you work and, you know, your work handle plus your personal handle and that you are actually on the Hangout. Um, so, Brew, are you ready to get these uh, community manager of the day started? I guess you yeah. are. I'm not. Yeah. I, I was covering yeah. that up. So, um, we had uh, Patty Lee, who's a friend of mine. I met her actually at my very first tweet up in Chicago. It was a sushi tweet up held by Scott Murphy. I met Patty Lee. I sat at her table. She works for Marketing Job Wire, which is a great marketing job uh, email that goes out every week, um, uh, especially in the Chicago area. So, anybody looking for community manager or marketing jobs in Chicago, um, get in touch with Patty. She is Pirate Alice on Twitter. And next one, Brew. And next we had John Mortar um, with Big Other, and it was very interesting. Um, John is actually looking forward to Social Media Week, which is coming up in various cities across the world, um, and including New York City in February of this year. So we're really excited for that coming up. Uh, and next one is Allie Greer. And for those of you that don't know Allie, Allie, did you see him here? I don't see Allie in here. Um, we, Allie is with Scoop It, and, which is a content curation platform. And Allie is one of my favorites, and I'm saying this, and I'm going to fully admit it, it's because she wrote a most awesome article, a blog post about HuffPost Live that got spread around our office and which got me, me a lot of credibility because I know her as a fellow community manager. So, Allie, thank you so much, and if you haven't checked out Scoop It, go do that. Next, we have Debbie Horovich, which is here today. Um, no video, but we got voice. So Debbie is with uh, Social Sparkle and Shine and also Cafe MOBA. Um, she's up in the Toronto area. Um, she has been a great resource for me and always has great things to say about me. And so how could I not say anything great about Debbie? She's just a wonderful person. Um, get to know her. She does some Google Hangouts herself. And next, we have Vicky Delonja, um, who I better know by Geeky Rock Chick, because how can you not forget that Twitter handle? And she is with uh, Fanscape and works on the Hotels.com brand as a community manager out in Southern California. And she is um, uh, going to be, uh, has helped me and talked with me on a couple different things. So, you know, I got a few different blog posts that will be coming up, and, and Vicky's been a tremendous help with some of my research on that. So, do we have one more? 
Nope, that's, that's it, it right? Tim. That's, okay, I, I forgot how many we were doing. All right, now let's get into the action here. So I'm going to go down really quick, and if you can just, we want to get into the questions really quick, so if you can just um, go down the line. We'll start with you, Debbie. Introduce yourself, um, you know, and if you're muted, make sure you unmute yourself. Uh, name and the company you're with. Hi, I'm Debbie Horovich, and I'm the social media community manager with Cafe Moba and owner of Social Sparkle and Shine. Excellent, and a community manager of the day this week. Yay! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and Garrett. Hey, I'm Garrett. I'm with Argyle Social. Uh, I also do some work for a company called Bystand. Fantastic. Great to have you here, Garrett. And Howard, I am so glad you made it on the Hangout this week. Are you muted? <laughs> we did hear Howard before, but I, I, are you muted now? Go in the upper right-hand corner and try and change it. I was letting Bruce stay up on my screen the whole time. <laughs> I forgot to unclick him. <laughs> 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 I don't think we have Howard, but Howard Howard Greenstein is with Harbrook Group. Um, he is one of the most brilliant minds who's been in the technology space um, for a very long time and very active here in the both the tech and the social media scene here in New York. So he's a great person to know. Hopefully we'll get his uh, audio going here soon. Howard's the best. <laughs> he is. And Jillian. Hi, everybody. How are you? Um, I'm great. What about you? Excellent. Hey, guys. Excellent. Uh, sorry. Oh, there he is. Okay, we can let Howard. Did I do a good job at introducing you, Howard? I, I have no idea since I was not only muted on microphone, but also on, on ears. I switched on my settings, and now I can hear you fine. And I'm sure that you did a perfect job, Tim, so keep moving along. Okay, great. Jillian, your turn. <laughs> oh, well, mine's short. I'm Jillian. I am a community manager of amongst a bunch of brands here on um, staff at Dragon Search in up, uptown, upstate, upstate New York. I'm not from here, so. Uh, it, as my mom, my mom told me, anything outside of the five bureaus in New York is upstate because oh, I live okay. in upstate too. So you, Those are, are boroughs. I got it right. <laughs> <laughs> and. Brew, my, uh, uh, my right-hand man on the Hangout. Sure. Hi. I'm, uh, I'm Brew, the director of Awesome at Be the Change Revolutions, and uh, do a number of things, uh, also some community management uh, for some brands, and uh, happy to be here. I just wanted to say uh, a marriage shout-out to Garrick uh, Chan, who uh, is sometimes in our Hangout. I saw on Facebook he updated his status, so uh, congratulations on getting married. Congrats, Garrick. Nice job. And Mitch, we're just going to skip over you just for a second. Okay. Or, no, we're going to – well, I forgot. Laura, I'm sorry. I, I got ahead of myself. Laura, how could no, I forget hi. you? <laughs> hi, guys. I'm Laura. I'm the community manager at Hootsuite for North and South America. We are so glad to have you here. And we're going to skip Mitch and come right back to you, and we'll go to Randy. Hey, Tim. How are you doing today? Great. How are you? I'm doing great. Just enjoying my Christmas down here in Panama. But, uh, yeah, I, I did the community management for uh, Panama Escape Artist, and this week I picked up a new brand, Miles Franklin, Texas <coughs> Metals out of Minnesota. So uh, I'm pretty busy. Nice, nice. Well, I, I think you're the first guest that we've had from, from Panama join us, so you have that right. distinction. <laughs> okay, great, Tim. <laughs> and, um, and real quick, I'm Tim. with uh, I'm the community manager for HuffPost Live. I also am the founder of my community manager and what we do here, and that's enough about me because I really want to get to Mitch Jackson. Um, Mitch, I, I could go on and on talking about you, but why don't we just hear it from you in your own words? Well, there's not much to say, Tim. It's really good to be here, you guys. I love the enthusiasm, and it's nice to meet everybody. I think if Community Manager had been around when I got out of school, I probably would have gone that route rather than becoming a trial lawyer. Uh, just, just love interacting with people. It's good to be here today, and Tim, thanks for asking me to be on. No, it's, it's my pleasure, and I know the first thing that most people were kind of asking me when I, when I said I was going to invite an attorney to be our guest on a community manager hangout was what in the world are you having a lawyer come and talk to community managers about and 
I, I, Mitch, I don't even know if I told you this. I know we exchanged a few emails and talked on the phone, but you know, I started thinking about it, and, and Mitch is just such a fascinating person, and he's got so much knowledge, and he, his connections and what he's done on his free cash shows are just phenomenal, and, and obviously his professional achievements at work speak for themselves, but I really stopped to think about this, and you know, lawyers have to pick a jury pool, right? And so when you're picking a jury pool, you look for certain things. You know, when you're, when you're, and you, you want to get the right person because your client, you know, the, their life basically can, can be in your hands based upon who's on that jury. So you are looking for things. You're, you're identifying things that are going to make an impact. When you're making your closing statements, you've already, you've not only told everything, you've listened to what other people are saying. You've observed what was happening in the jury. So you're creating these things. So I think there are so many similarities between what attorneys do and I'm specifically talking, you are a, a, a trial attorney, so, you know, or a trial lawyer, so, you know, you do deal with juries, and, and so specifically with that, because I know not all attorneys do, but specifically with that, there are so many similarities between that and community management and what we do with our external communities that I, I just really felt that this was an absolutely fabulous, you know, opportunity and venue to have you come in and join. So it was perfect timing. I was stuck with uh, the Brazilian legal system this week, so I'm really excited to hear all you have to say, Mitch. <laughs> okay, great. Awesome. Well, let, let's kind of start off, Mitch, and just in your words, you know, why don't you tell us what sure. you see as some of the similarities between trial lawyers and community managers now that I've given my version. <laughs> Well, I think, I think you hit it dead on. I got into the practice of law because I like people. I like helping people and interacting with people. I like communicating with people. And what each of you do is you're communicating your brand, your product, your interest with other third parties. So it's really important to be an effective communicator to get your message across, to close deals. With me in front of a jury, Tim, if you take it back to the very beginning of a trial when we're selecting a jury, uh, many trial lawyers will tell you that's when trials are won and lost. It's about voir dire. It's about the jury selection pro uh, process. And you know what's interesting today with all of us having to communicate in our business, in our occupations, in our professions? A hundred years ago, the average attention span for a human being was about 20 minutes. There wasn't that much going on. You could take your time with getting to a point with sharing your story. Today, it's around nine seconds. Today, uh, you have nine seconds to capture someone's attention. You have nine seconds to fascinate somebody uh, and to make your point. Otherwise, they're going to tune you off. They're going to click away or in a trial setting, they're going to be looking at you straight in the eyes, but they're not going to be listening. So I'm fascinated about different approaches different techniques with communicating in the courtroom with clients sitting across from my desk and many of these same principles I'm sure many of you use to communicate every day in your jobs but uh, maybe that's what I can bring to the table or some of my thoughts and ideas and techniques that I've used over the last 27 years to effectively try cases for my clients. Well, so I mean, Mitch, you nailed it, and I know most people on this Hangout have heard me talk about how I boil down community management, and it used to be one word, and I kind of expanded it into two words, but that first word that I ever got was, you know, connections, <laughs> and, and obviously the other one being communication. So who else, you know, has some ideas of, you know, how you view the similarities, or do you have questions, um, you know, based upon what Mitch answered as far as how he's looking at the similarities between attorneys and community managers? First thing that came to my mind when you were talking about having to uh, capture someone's attention was just speak in tweets, right? I mean, just, <laughs> you know, uh, if there's one thing Twitter's done for us, it's um, help us communicate in short little bursts. Um, and, uh, and so I think that that's definitely kind of a, a little relatable. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with what Brew was saying. I had the same thought, um, which is basically when you're on Twitter and you have 140 characters or sometimes 124 if you have to type CMGR hangout after it, um, then you, know, you have to figure out what's the most important thing I want to say. How do I want to make sure that I convey what I'm saying in a, in a tight package but also not lose the, the emotion or the, um, the subtlety of what I'm trying to communicate. And sometimes it's really hard to do that. Sometimes you have to use more than one tweet. Sometimes you have to think outside the Twitter box. But obviously getting people's attention quickly is um, and, and making sure that that small bit brings it um, 
clearly to them is, is, is a crucial skill in, in community and online management. Definitely, and making it sticky, right? And I love the idea of speaking in tweets because people tend to gravitate towards certain little catchphrases or things that sort of stick out. So that's an awesome way to look at it. The other thing that came to mind was when you talked about, you know, kind of, uh, you know, just the, the picking the try or picking the, uh, the the people that decide, right? That that could win or lose. I think um, for us as community managers, when we're looking for advocates or brand evangelists, um, you know, that's that's also kind of uh, very similar as well. Uh, a great uh, advocate, a great evangelist, can do uh, a, a lot of things for our campaigns and, and for our brand awareness. If I if I might, uh, concerning brand awareness, I'm of the opinion that people, they don't want to connect with brands, they want to connect with other people. Okay, they want to connect with with you who's reaching out to them, develop a rapport, a relationship. People will not remember what you said, but people will remember how you make them feel. So when I stand up in front of a jury and I start talking with them, I think, what, you know, what's my end result? What, what is it that I want to achieve? And let's just say the topic is whether or not a light was red or green. That's my final goal at the end of the trial. I talk to jurors and I talk to people about uh, uh, what do they look like? What do they normally look at when they're driving down the street? What do they uh, put their attention on? Are they are they texting? Do they use their cell phone? They're not going to admit to doing that. But I try to get a feel for people. How attentive are they on different topics, on different interests? There's a ton of things that we look at, but it all comes from asking open-ended questions and being real with them. When people, uh, unlike television, when people and you have these conversations during trial, some people will tell you, you know, I don't like lawyers. I wish I wasn't here. I wish I was home with my family and children. You don't take someone on about that issue. You acknowledge their concerns. I know how you feel. Frankly, before I became an attorney, I felt the same way. And, and you basically empower them and, and enforce their beliefs, but then you engage a conversation with them so that everybody else can hear what you're saying. And, uh, you know, it's interesting when you talk about tweeting, and, and talking in tweets and short sound bites. What's interesting, and, and I think Tim will tell you this because this is how our relationship really progressed, 82% of people actually are fascinated or develop rapport with other people using the phone or, or in-person conversations. It's not chats, it's not tweets, it's not comments on a blog, although I love all that stuff, don't get me wrong. But if you're trying to close a deal, the way you can separate yourself from everyone else. And this is what I do with opposing counsel when I want to close a deal. I put the email aside, and you know what? I take someone out to lunch and we talk. I pick up the phone. This is a really old tool that a lot of you aren't familiar with, but it works really, really well. My daughter doesn't even know what this is, by the way. But I pick up the phone and make a phone call, and you can hear someone's voice reflection. You can hear the passion that someone has and it's just easier for me to connect using those tools, um, but I don't want to hog the uh, the, the, the well, hangout. No, no, you're our guest, Mitch. That's I mean, <laughs> you you basically had the floor. And I just I just want to say, your daughter is is at UCLA, so it's not like she's you know she's eight or ten. I mean, she's she's a little bit older, so she's been around for for a, a few years already, and she still doesn't even know what that phone looks like. But, <laughs> Um, and Mitch, I, I definitely agree. And you, you and I both, I think, and I'm just kind of sidetracking here a little bit. You and I both really see, you know, the the phone and in person meetings are one thing, but the closest thing that we can get, even even more than a phone, in my mind, is doing what we're doing, even if it's not Absolutely. with nine other people watching. Because you and I can get on this Hangout or any other live streaming platform, and we are getting that. We're seeing the expressions. We're you know we're understanding what's happening in the background. Uh, which is why people are muting me because there's a party going on behind me. So, um, you know, those are all things that we can kind of sense and get a feel for that we don't get through text, which I think is so important. Um, and I just, a major part of our philosophy at Hootsuite is is the video stuff when we're when we're onboarding ambassadors and envoys because you you can misconstrue things in a chat. It feels a little distant, like Mitch was saying. You can't feel the passion, but you also you can't get them as excited. You you kind of don't get that personal connection and it, it makes all the difference in making somebody feel like they're part of a cult or a club especially if you're not sorry <laughs> um, especially if you're not um, 
face to face with them, it's it's hard to keep that excitement going. Laura, is that a is that a social media injury? Did you like someone too hard? Was that I I, I actually <laughs> it was a social Santa thing and. Uh, I, uh, I climbed down too many chimneys, I think. <laughs> oh, no. So I wanted to go back to what Mitch uh, was just talking about with the voice and being able to hear people's passions. Um, as, a, as a former on-air radio personality, I learned how to smile when you talk to people because it really yeah. you know, projects out there. And you, know, you, get that, um, you get that from people when you're talking to them either on the phone or in person. But as an online um, person, it's still the same thing. You have to find that person's voice. You have to see what their level of intensity is. I'll, I'll go back to what Tim was talking about briefly before about the uh, horrible gun incident in um, Connecticut and all the children um, uh, who were killed. And, you know, basically I had to shut down Facebook. I couldn't keep, you know, seeing this over and over again and either agreeing with people or disagreeing with people. And so I just had to put it away. Um, and sometimes you have to step away from that kind of thing and you know you hear people's voices and they're angry or they're sad or they're upset or whatever and it, it you know, after a while text can convey that um, emotion that voice and video do, does I mean Shakespeare did a pretty darn good job of it four centuries ago um, in in being able to convey you know humor and emotion and passion without any um, without any uh, video chat you know, Howard, uh, one of my best friends growing up, we used to do a lot of hang gliding back in Tucson, Arizona, and he was a radio DJ on an FM radio station. I used to love listening to his voice. And just because of the deep voice that he had, he actually commanded attention. What he said sure. had more validity to it than, than what someone else might say. And it's interesting when we're all communicating with other people, when I'm communicating with, with opposing counsel outside of the courtroom or a judge or a jury inside the courtroom, it's so much more than just speaking. It, what I tell young lawyers, and the hardest thing for a lawyer to learn is to stop talking. You know, we have one of these and two of these. <laughs> and to listen. I mean, but seriously, sure. commu communicating is about listening. It's about asking a short, open-ended question to a jury. Stop talking, okay? Quit thinking so highly of yourself that you think you're here to grace everyone with your wisdom and intelligence, okay? Those are the lawyers that lose trials. What you want to do is empower your jury. Ask a question and stop talking and listen to what they have to say and get involved. Get involved from your heart in the conversation and that's how you connect with other people. I'll tell you that the first two minutes of my opening statement, the first two minutes of my voir dire which happens before opening, in my opinion is the most powerful and most important part of the trial. You have two minutes to make your point and the most effective way to use those first two minutes, and I don't care if you're cold calling somebody about a product, about what you're doing, you've got two minutes to make an impact. The best way to make an impact is to focus on their needs, their wants, their desires, and to do it through short story and to do it through metaphor. Those two elements of storytelling, I think, are so powerful and so much fun to learn how to do that if all of us would learn how to use stories and incorporate metaphors, uh, I think we'd be more effective in communicating our message and closing deals. And I've got a couple of examples, Tim, that we can go into a little bit later. Well, yeah, and I wanted to kind of ask you, you know, I mean, we're talking about the, the importance of communication and how we're, how we're communicating and, and relating to the other person. Um, that first communication, you do it when you meet a client. You do it when you first see a juror. Um, we do it when we're reaching out to you know, ambassadors. We do it when we're reaching out to a community member that made a great, you know, great comment or tweet. What What are some of the important things to remember when you're making that first connection, Mitch? Well, I think what's important, and I and I've tried to teach my kids this over the years, is you never have a second chance to make a good first impression. So people will make right or wrong. They're going to make an, an initial first impression based upon the way you look, sound, smell taste in some situations, what, how, you, how they hear your voice. When I'm trying cases, Tim, my first impression is when I pull into the parking lot at the courthouse. That's when it's game on. As far as I know, there are witnesses, there are jurors at the courthouse. I low-key it, very respectful to everyone. I don't use the attorney line walking into the courthouse. There's usually a long line 
of potential jurors and witnesses and, and participants, and there's a short line that attorneys can walk through quickly. I see the look that attorneys get when they use that short line, okay? And there are jurors standing in the longer line. I'll stand in that longer line, spend five or ten minutes, uh, and I'm one of them. When we're in the hallways, walking back and forth, you're communicating with people using your eyes. How do you handle yourself? By the time you get into the courtroom, almost every single time I've tried a case, and I've had over 65 trials over the last 27 years, I see somebody in the jury box who I saw standing out in line, in the you know, getting into the building, who I might have said good morning to in the parking lot, not knowing that they were a juror. So the communication starts before the actual event begins, and. Um, you know, Jerry Spence, who's a very well-known trial lawyer, he's been on CNN, he's had some of, some very high-profile cases, great books out there, he will tell you the secret to communicating, to winning every argument, is to speak from the heart, to be real. If you stutter, I want you to be the best stutterer in the world in front of that jury. If you have a problem with using long sentences or long paragraphs in your explanation of something, Shorten it down to short sound bites, to short tweets, but be the best you can be being yourself. Okay, so that's, that's my secret is people love listening to people that are being real. And I'm not the most articulate person in the world. I never have been, but my secret in front of a jury is just to be myself. I don't use a lot of big words, not a lot of legal terms. I communicate with them in a in a in a method or fashion uh, where they can understand the point I'm getting. Uh, you know, I'm trying to get across. Uh, here's an example. Let's say, for example, you have a case where you're representing somebody against big tobacco, and somebody's got lung cancer and they're dying. You could stand up in front of a jury in closing argument and say something like, "Each year, 300,000 people die from tobacco," and then you could proceed in your closing argument or when you get to, the, to that particular point in your closing argument you have a PowerPoint picture of your client in the hospital room looking bad you know dying of cancer behind you pop up as you explain that each year in the United States uh, to give you an idea of what 300,000 deaths correlate to in the United States what if I was to tell you that that's the equivalent of two jumbo jets crashing every single day for a year? That's the same number of people that die each year from cancer. If two jets were going down each year and crashing, wouldn't you expect the airline industry to place a large warning at the airport that this could happen to you. So you're using metaphors, you're using stories to try to emphasize a particular point. And that really wasn't a very good example, but but I think you can feel it a little bit more and I think it makes more of an impact with your lay people in the jury. Okay, this this is I love this because this is what seems to be a, a trend that I'm hearing over and over and over and those of you that have heard me listen to me before I fully say that learning from the best talker and I, I hate using the word storyteller because storyteller is like such a cliche word these days but learning from the best speech writers the ones that are writing like President Obama's speeches learning from people that speak and not just how they speak but the, the, what the process is for going into making those speech. Mitch, you just did a great job kind of describing that, and I think that is something that we really need to do, not only to our external audience, but also internally, I think like we talked about last week with Greg Meyer, you know, internally to our, our you know, management as far as how we convey the, the numbers and the, the metrics that we're getting as community managers, some of them, especially the qualitative ones, have to be told in a story, not just by presenting the numbers. And I think you just did a great job of, of explaining that, Mitch. Um, but what does everybody else think? And and we got to get some people in here. You know the rules. You take a seat in the hangout. You better not just sit there and not talk. So let's, Garrett, you've been pretty quiet. Debbie? <laughs> Tim, while, while they're coming on, it's also a talent that you can use uh, at home with your family. 
when interacting with your with your loved one, with your partner, with your children. It, it's something that uh, if you use it correctly, you can avoid a lot of arguments. Hey, Garrett. I was moving, and it made my chords make noise. That's okay. I, I, I think that this is a fascinating conversation. I think that it's a, a valid point. Um, kind of one of some of the things that I was interested in. Um, it's been a it's been a worldwide conversation. I haven't jumped in uh, enough, but uh, uh, when relating to like lawyers to Twitter streams, there's there's something about that that I, I almost find unsettling. Um, where you know if somebody's <laughs> telling me what uh, ice cream they like, uh, 140 characters is fine. But if somebody's talking to me in tweets about if I'm going to go to jail for the next 10 years, like that's that's seems like something that's more uh, I want to be more concrete. Um, and so the, the question is, uh, how do you stay simple uh, while maintaining a, that degree of professionalism or that degree of solemnity? Am I up or is Howard up? <laughs> I think you're up. I forgot I was muted. I think you're 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 the one he was asking. I <laughs> yeah, no, no. I mean, uh, first of all, you're going to have that conversation with somebody sitting across from your desk. And I've always found in difficult conversations when I'm giving advice to to a client. And my job is 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 to tell someone what I think, not necessarily what they want to hear. And um, it's always good to uh, to you know take your time. Uh, talk to the other person about what their needs, wants, and desires are, and then pattern or model your 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 message along those lines. Um, one, th you know, I wouldn't do that on Twitter. Uh, you know, but I'll tell you something: all you guys, all the community managers, all the communications that you're sending out there when you're using social media, and Tim will tell you, I love social media. It, I just, it, it's a great way to expand your sphere of influence. It's a great way to meet new people. Um, it doesn't mean you can't use stories and metaphors in your social media messages. You can put something out there quickly and easily that no one's going to read, nobody's going to click on, nobody's going to follow up with you about, or you can use storytelling, incorporating metaphors, focusing on their benefits and their needs in the same amount of space and get a much higher reaction. It's all about tapping and transporting. and. Tim, I don't know if you want me to talk about tapping or transporting, but it's it's a approach that I've used that's changed the way I try cases. And it was taught to me by a friend, Craig Valentine. Craig was the 1999 world champion of public speaking. Uh, he competed against 25,000 com competitors in you know dozens of, of countries. And uh, his approach to edge of your seat storytelling has been literally a, a game changer for for how I handle mediations, arbitrations, discuss issues with clients, and specifically to try my cases. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about tapping and transporting because it's easy to do, and it's a very effective method to getting your message across. Well, that was that was touches on my next question because, as Tim said, the the term storyteller has become trite in the last couple of years, especially in community management where, or in business in general, the idea is to tell a story to get people onto your side. Uh, and it's often said in a, in a lyrical way of, you know, storytelling is the future of community management. But very few people give first steps for people. Not everyone is a natural storyteller. So for the non-naturals, where do we start? Let, let me give you an example. Uh, first of all, whoever's telling you that, you need to let it go in one ear and out the other. Okay? Uh, that's bad advice. All right? Communicating, we've been sitting around fires since, the, you know, since day one telling stories late into the evening. And what's important is, and let, you know what, let me just share an example with you. It's not telling a story, it's explaining the facts a different way. It's called tapping and transporting. And here's what I'm talking about. Let's say we have an issue where I'm in front of a jury and it has to do with who ran the red light at an intersection. Okay, I could stand up and say, now this case is about Mr. Jones uh, being injured as a result of Mrs. Smith running a red light at an intersection. We will prove liability and damages and we will ask you at the end of this trial to award money damages to pay for my client's medical bills and the pain and suffering that she went through. 
Okay, I'm barely awake right now just listening to myself speak. But, you know, the truth of the matter is that's what you normally hear in court. It's not what you see on TV. Those are actors memorizing scripts, and, and it's fun to watch, but that's not the way it works in the real world. Now, imagine me, instead of going that route, approaching my jury from this perspective. Now, you didn't hear that. The judge calls my name, I stand up, and I walk over in front of the jury, and I ask you, how many of you, raise your hand, how many of you have ever been in a serious automobile crash? Raise your hand right now. How many of you have family members or friends whose lives have been changed forever because of a serious automobile accident? We start off with that. Well, that's why we're here today. Let me take your hand. Come with me, and I want to tell you, and I want to show you what happened to Garrett two years ago on Main Street in Main Street, USA. Take my hand and let's go back to, into, into time. Garrett and I are standing on the corner at Main Street and Vine. You hear a loud roar coming from your right. It's Mrs. Jones' vehicle. It's a, you know, a 1969 Mustang that's been modified by a performance automobile. It's traveling at twice the speed limit. You see the vehicle passing you and you can smell the exhaust, okay? Uh, and see the black smoke as it comes from behind. To your left, you hear a horn, and it's Mr. Mr. Johnson, uh, who observed, you know, Mr. Smith coming, and he hit his horn. You hear a loud horn. The next thing you think you see are two vehicles colliding. You hear metal crunching. You see, you know, Mrs. Jones' passenger side door get pushed all the way across and crunched into the far side of the vehicle. You see the vehicles flip upside down with their wheels spinning. You smell the gas streaming out of the side door, the bottom of the vehicle, almost over to where you're standing. You look down and wonder your, to yourself whether or not the vehicles are going to catch fire and that fire is going to immediately rush to where you're standing. You know, that's why we're here today. So I shared the facts two different ways, but in the second method, I tried to touch upon placing you there so you have a present perception of what's happening. You're tasting, you're smelling, you're seeing, and you're hearing. We're using all of your senses in digesting what's happened in the story. And that was just an intersection automobile case. If you have something that involves, you know, a very serious injury, paralysis, or wrongful death, by the time you're done with your opening statement, you can look in the juror's eyes and they're, they're nodding. They understand why you're here. They understand that this just isn't another case. You can do the same thing with your customers and your clients. Obviously, what you want to do is you want to tap into them. Haven't you always wanted to reach out and into the uh, you know into the East Coast market, and why haven't you done that before? Because if you if you're able to sell these products on the East Coast using these tools and methods, wouldn't that increase revenues by 50 percent? Let's let's go to New York right now and let's see which stores we can walk to or which stores we can open up and business with, and and how that would work. And then you go with the touch, taste, smell incorporating those facts into your presentation. Do you see how you're sending the same messages and you're having the same conversation, but you're just doing it a different way? That's what I mean by storytelling. I think it's, it's a really engaging way of uh, communicating with people. And, and it's funny to me because engagement is one of those, those keywords, almost one of those overused buzzwords that we talk about a lot in community management as well. Um, but it forces people to... To, to listen to you a little bit more closely and, and with a lot more awareness. Um, and, and I love that. I, I think, uh, Mitch, I just want to say you're, you're completely revolutionizing the way that I'm going to be approaching my communities and my, my conversations. Good. With them. So Good. Thank you. It works. It works. You won't be disappointed. And uh, some, of the, uh, some of my friends and some of the people who I follow and have really done a good job of you know, consolidating all of this into a book or a course. If you read uh, Sally Hogshead's Fascinate, it's a book called Fascinate, uh, she talks about why it's not about sharing information anymore. It's about taking advantage of those nine seconds and fascinating somebody so that you've got, so, so that you have a genuine foundation to build a relationship on. So I'd highly recommend Sally's book, Fascinate. I love Craig Valentine's course. You can Google him. He's got multiple courses. And um, Jerry Spence, the trial lawyer, he has a uh, trial lawyer college 
that uh, puts on uh, you know courses and seminars where you actually go and live on this ranch. I don't think there's any electricity. You're out in the middle of nowhere. There's no internet. But he talks about you know speaking from your heart and getting back to your roots and explaining these processes to other people. I will tell you it takes a little bit more preparation. You have to think about your message before you pick up the phone or, or go online and communicate this with somebody. But I mean what's your end result? If your end result is to close a deal or make a new connection or get somebody you know on a show, um, it's probably worth the effort and you will be that one percent that takes that, that extra bit of effort to close that deal. 99% of the people are too lazy to do that and it's so easy to separate yourself from everybody else. Completely. Stories and metaphors make everything less threatening, right? It, it makes people, I think self-identifying is a very powerful tool and it makes, makes a, more, a far deeper emotional connection. Absolutely. And when you're, uh, Laura, by the way, I love Hootsuite. I use it all the time. Yeah. Uh, Yes, when uh, when you're telling these these stories, like I, I shared with uh, Garrett earlier, incorporate conversations. In other words, uh, you know, Laura responded, blah blah blah, and then Jim came back and said, blah blah blah. You can have a di a running dialogue in your storytelling in your presentation. You can have conflict. You can have a villain. You can have a hero. Now, here's the important part that most people forget to do. Depending, you know, let's just say you're a community manager and you're trying to close a deal. When you're done with your presentation and your story, the most important thing is you got to have a closing. You got to have a, uh, 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 what's the word I'm thinking of? You know, a call out. You have to make sure that when it's all said and done, you invite them back to your site. You close the deal. I need you to sign right here with my jury. I'm very specific about what I'm looking for. Once I've painted that picture, uh, I make sure they understand that when they're back in that jury deliberation room, they know exactly what they need to do. And by the way, when you're, Laura, when you're communicating with somebody, you're not asking them to do something for you. You're asking them to do something for a principle, for an end result, for a need or a want. If they want to increase revenues, if they follow your advice, these, this is the good stuff that will happen to them. When I have a jury, I separate my client from, from, what I'm asking a jury to do. I'm asking a jury to go back in a jury room and do the right thing for our society, for our local community. They need to send a message that this type of conduct's not okay. I don't ask them to do something for my particular client. So you empower the recipient of your message with a purpose, with something even bigger than, than what the initial conversation's about so that they are fascinated about your message they're empowered to take action and they're glad, Lori, that you contacted them because they know if they, if they follow your advice, good things are going to happen for company, company X. They're not doing it for you, they're doing it for their wants and their needs. Definitely. I mean, I find the most effective way for me talking about it is I can make your life easier and less stressful and, and kind of figuring out, do you have this problem and this problem? Like, I've been in your shoes. Like, I, like you said, I think that... I like that. The most effective thing is to think about how you can help them rather than how you can help yourself and you find out that they can bring a lot more than sometimes you could ever offer initially. That's a good point. Right, you're not selling you're not selling them software, you're selling them solution. It's the old you're not selling someone a quarter inch drill bit, you're you're selling them the hole that you're using to put up the painting that's the family um, you know, picture from Christmas that everybody loves. You know, you don't really want the drill bit. You want the hole there. You want the the nail up, and you want the picture on. And that's kind of the end result. And that's Laura, what I think you were talking about, and uh, mm -hmm. in a much bigger way, what Mitch is talking about. I mean, I think I, I signed up at Hootsuite because I think we could change the world. Like, I wasn't looking for a gig, and I'm a big. I, my old background was in political science, and uh, I was really nerdy and I had done a study about how um, generating social capital on the internet and I discovered that um, when the Arab Spring went on um, and they had blocked Facebook and Twitter the only way that people could access the internet was through third-party applications like Hootsuite and because Hootsuite had crowd had cared enough about their, their people on the ground they had crowdsourced translation into Arabic 
So we saw our spikes go up like 3,000% overnight. And the U.S. you know, State Department and news resources and the government, everybody was coming to us to ask for information. And I mean, to me, that's the most powerful thing is, is getting other people's voices out there and allowing them to change the world because I can't tackle it all myself. It's, it's just giving your community the tools to go out there and, and make a difference. Laura, that is so important. If you fascinate people with your message, it's not about the information you're trying to communicate. It's about empowering them to turn around and share that message, share that product, share that service with their sphere of influence. And if you're able to do that, if I'm able to tap into one juror and have that one juror go back into the deliberation room and root for me and be a cheerleader for our cause, then I've won the case. And uh, you hit it dead on. That is so important for people to realize it's, it's not about having something, well, I don't want to duplicate myself, but that's very important for people to realize you hit it right on the head. You know, Mitch, Mitch we, we call that uh, an ambassador. You're, you're one cheerleader that you get to go in the jury room is what we're looking for in brand yeah. ambassadors to go out <laughs> and be our cheerleaders out in the marketplace. So it's, I told you guys, I mean, there's so much correlation here right, between the yeah. law between community management. It's almost freaky. Um, Was it the, the Newton quote where he said, you know, if I have done anything, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. Like I, that to me is just the greatest way of looking at it. And, you know, and what was the other one from Picasso? Like great artists don't copy, they steal. <laughs> the whole idea is, uh, you know, building, <laughs> it, it's, it's more than you. You're kind of looking at how you can help the world become a better place and how you mm -hmm. can help everybody else do it in the process. And it's a more exciting journey. It is, especially in today's, in today's world with technology, with social media, with how we're communicating. Uh, <laughs> we, we just had, a, uh, we just had a, a big case come down in, in California, brand new law. We changed law in the state of California and it has to, and this just came down two days ago. Uh, California Supreme Court made a decision, it's now law. It has to do with if you watch somebody harm your pet intentionally, in our case it was with a bat, and you suffer emotional distress damages because of that, and not everybody does, but if you do, then you're entitled to seek damages against the person who harmed your pet. To me, it's common sense. That wasn't the law in California uh, since day one. As of Thursday, it's now the law. What's really exciting for me as a lawyer is that message, that case site, this new information, immediately was distributed across all the major social media platforms uh, in all of the animal rights groups, uh, everyone's contacting us and contacting you know people associated with the case about this new law. Now what's really cool is if we use the tools and techniques that we've talked about today, if we share this, if I was just to put the case up on the screen, it looks boring. It's just, you know, it's, it's your typical casebook law. You open it up and it's not that exciting to read. But when you talk about the facts of the case, about this little dog being hit by a bat, rolling head over tail down the slope, slamming into a tree, breaking its leg, requiring surgery, um, people appreciate that type of story and they want to hear more. So when we shared this new law with our, with our tribe, with our followers, we, we shared it in a way that hopefully was an entertaining story message with metaphors such that people would click on the links and read more about it. So I don't care what you do for a living, you can, you can tap into these techniques to be a more effective communicator. Totally. It's about making it relatable, right? Like, you're, like you were saying, you read a piece of, you know, a legal document and people don't even understand what they're, what they're saying. But the, the intent behind it is so powerful. And mm -hmm. I feel like the marketing messages and everything that's kind of put out there right now is very much, you know, clinical. It's almost trying to hide what's really going on and pulling the wool over people's eyes. So if you can kind of demystify it and make it something that they can, they can picture themselves or their brother or their mother doing, you know, or their sister, how it would benefit them. It's a, it's a whole different way of looking at it. So, so yeah. that's an interesting point because I, I haven't really run into anybody who it's like, you know, you need to tell a story and they're like, I'd rather create a manual. Um, <laughs> so the, the question becomes like what stops people from telling that story? What are, the, what are the roadblocks keeping people from telling stories every day? They don't know how to tell a story. They don't know the elements of storytelling. And between you and me, up until about three years ago, I didn't either. 
what I was doing was working, but it was not refined. It wasn't a refined process. And uh, through the materials I've already shared with you, there are seven or eight really important steps to, you know, getting your point across in a story format. And once you get those steps down, okay, and I'm doing it right now with you, Garrett. Uh, if you'd like to more, know more about these steps, I want you to call me. No, but you see how you can walk people along and you, you build a climax. You use headings with your voice, okay, to take people to the next step. They want to hear what happens next. And there are seven really important steps to telling a good story. And on our next Google Hangout, Garrett, I'll tell you all about it. Ah. I, I, a real man, I see it. <laughs> Well, let, let me, because uh, I know we're we're getting into the last 10 minutes, and I just had a couple more questions that I, I mean don't really necessarily relate directly to, you know, social media. They don't really relate directly to community management. I think they just, they relate to, I think, everything that we do in life. And, you know, one of those questions, Mitch, and I, I you know, I actually learned something when I, when I read your bio again last night. I actually read the full bio instead of just the snort, short snort, <laughs> short snapshot. Um, and I learned, you know, like the, where you came from and what your parents did in, in Arizona and kind of the, the upbringing that you had there. And it kind of translates into what I think your parents did, what you're doing, and I think what most of us all do. It, it's, you know, we're all networking, right? We're all making these connections. And so what are some of the tips that you've really found that you can kind of share, you know, for somebody that might not realize the importance of networking, you know, how to really get better at networking with people. I'd say don't be afraid to share your story, your unique story, whatever it is with other people. Don't be afraid to be transparent. What Tim's referring to is a bio on one of our websites that doesn't talk about where I went to school, where I went to law school, what you know awards or verdicts we've had. It's a bio that talks about where I grew up in Tucson, Arizona, on a guest ranch that my mom and dad owned. And we'd have people come and stay with us and play cowboy and, and uh, grew up riding horses, you know, uh, doing rodeo, enjoyed motocross, hang gliding, windsurfing. Uh, it it's, has more to do with the personal side of me. And what I found is when people call, that's why they call. They are online looking for a solution to their problem, and all they get is, a single typical lawyer website that talks about how great the lawyer is. They can't relate to that. When they come to our site, they read more about me. They read more about Lisa, who's my wife and my partner, and they they immediately connect with one of us, and then the phone rings. So, Tim, to answer your question, I tell young adults that we mentor, you know, it's all about helping other people. It's all about networking in a, in a real and genuine fashion. What can you do for somebody else? And if you incorporate that approach genuinely into your daily activities, it keeps things fun. It keeps things passionate. You'll enjoy what you're doing. And over time, you're going to get really good results. You're going to make connections. And, you know, there's nothing more enjoyable than helping somebody out. Uh, you know, over the long term, things normally do come around full circle. So that would be that would be my thoughts on the matter. And Jillian, you got a question? Because remember, not everybody that's except that they're in the hangout can see what you're chatting here. We got a lot of chatter in the chat, and Jillian actually asked a good question. So why don't you throw it out there? Are you unmuted? Uh, now I am. Yes, you are. <laughs> um, I was just having this question while he, while um, Mitch was talking about um, these techniques to engage the uh, jury and um, make contact with the jury prior to a case. Um, these describe techniques that engage an audience that's sort of captive in a way, like they can't go away and they will re-engage because it's their duty to judge the case. Mm -hmm. So. Um, how do these techniques sort of translate to engaging a new crop, like a continually new crop of visitors and viewers and audience members throughout the public social web? Jillian, that's, that's a really good question, and I love your last name, by the way. Oh, thank you. Um, you're welcome. And uh, it's interesting. It's all about uh, at one time 
what lawyers would do, what a lot of professionals would do is it was all about them. Come to our website because we're great. Follow us on social media because we're great. And frankly, that's not the case, but we're not going to go there. That's another topic for another time. I found that by providing free resources, laying it all out there, this is, this is what you need to do if you're involved in a medical malpractice case or a defective product case or an automobile accident type of case. Here's the A to Z. Here's everything you need to know. Okay, um, it's sharing information. There are no um, ulterior, you know, agendas here. In other words, it's genuinely providing good content for other people, and then complementing that content with the different social media platforms that you're involved with. You know, it's not the platform; it's how you use the platform. It's not the tool; it's what you put out there. And I think if you share good information while at the same time using that to build relationships for referrals for new business um, what what then happens is the phone rings off the hook I mean that's that's the way to go about it is just share good information there's a it's a different world now you can't keep all these little secrets to yourself these secrets are readily available in a Google search you know how to do a contract how to do an independent contractor or licensing agreement they're out there what people want is they want to make sure this stuff's done correctly so if you share you know five tips to negotiating your next community manager contract what every community manager should have in his or her contract and lay out that information uh, people like that people respect the fact that you're sharing good information with them and that's how that relationship bond starts happening and frankly um, uh, it's fun to do you know, I enjoy what I'm doing after 27 years of practicing law I look forward to coming to work every day I absolutely love helping people and I think it's reflected in our client base learn how to say no to people we say no to 18 out of 20 every prospective new client I only want to work with people I can help and people I enjoy representing it's a deal breaker for me life's too short I don't need the aggravation so um, I don't know I hope that answers your question uh, it didn't <laughs> well, what was your um, question well, the things that you were talking about with the storytelling and um, you know setting the story in motion to to uh, capture the attention of your perspective um, of your jury mm -hmm. while in the courtroom, mm -hmm. um, engaging on social media and um, you know uh, attaining new business and networking. That's something that a lot of us are, if not in love with, we are accustomed to. You know comfortable with doing mm -hmm. um, maybe I've taken a step too far with some of us but um, <laughs> you know in general where we're familiar with that part of the business networking and getting to know people but um, the techniques that you were talking about within the courtroom with the audience that you want to definitely get an action out of a definitely measurable action out of at that um, how did those equate to activities that we can do on our social channels where our mm -hmm. audiences are not captive and they can come and go as they please they can show up in the middle of our story or they can show up right after we got done mm -hmm. telling a story and then we don't have a new one ready yet easy well, yeah, Jill, Jillian, stories ready. but but the answer is easy and the answer is using the same tip uh, t tips and techniques using the same approach I just shared is what you need to be doing online the difference is because you've got to capture their attention you've got to fascinate them and the way I've just explained to you I do that with my jury is what you need to be doing online and you need to reset maybe 30 seconds 45 seconds into your online video uh, Google hangout with somebody you reset as to hey everybody we're here today to talk about blah 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 and then go back into your story so, Jillian, the answer is easy, uh, and that is doing it exactly the same way, whether you want to or not. That's my advice. Can I also throw something out there, Jillian, which is that, you know, you may have a blog post from two months ago that people suddenly decide to engage with, right? They may choose to ask a comment, or they may choose to, uh, you know, uh, jump in in the story that you're already done with and that whatever it is that you were talking about two months ago on a particular conversation thread may be gone but if they're there and that's what they want to talk about now then that's where you meet with them that's where you engage with them and um, 
you know, there's constantly um, a flow of information. And yeah, just yesterday I was looking for a discussion that was in a Facebook group that had happened three months ago, and I posted something to it, and immediately it was the topic of conversation for that group again, as people, you know, had an opinion upon it. Again, you never know where those conversations will pop up. Um, so have the have those um, those things there. The other thing is about um, where you are not sure, you know, someone's going to come in after your story is done. Um, I, you know, always tell people to have an editorial calendar because you're going to have to have lots of stories. You know, know what the next 20 things are that you're going to want to say. That way you're ready to have another story if that person wants something else. Um, also, having had young kids, I don't want to hear that story, Daddy. I want to hear a different story. It's always good to have a backup. Well, and you I and your story, your story. Remember the he headlines. Each part of your story is a transition to the next thirty seconds, the next sixty seconds. So if somebody comes in late, once they hear this next headline, this next caption, they're going to want to hear what you have to do next. Tim, I have to run uh, to depositions that I talked to you about, and I've <laughs> got to get out the door, you guys. I really appreciate being here. This has been a real pleasure, and Tim, it's always good to see you, my friend. Thank you so much, Mitch. I really thank appreciate you. you taking the time and, and get you. out of here, and we'll finish it up and wrap it up. And thank you again. Okay, you guys. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Mitch. Thank you. Uh, bye bye. Thanks for enlightening us. <laughs> <laughs> so, everybody, I just I hate to cut this short because I know Mitch, um, he actually does have depositions that he's heading into right now. Um, I, asked, I told him he could leave early, and he actually stuck around right till the very end. Um, I have a meeting I need to go to. I'm sure it's going crazy over in our newsroom with everything that's happening. So I am going to get going there. Um, I, I can't tell you, I mean, how important I think this whole subject is. And, and what I love about it is it relates to community managers, but it also relates to, I think, anybody that's in business, anybody that's doing anything on their own, anybody that's networking. Um, this advice that that we've gotten here and and all of you have added something too so it has been tremendous for me I think you know why I like Mitch um, why I love talking with him and why I'm so happy he agreed to come and join us uh, you can follow him on Twitter at at Mitch Jackson um, and I would go on Spreecast I tweeted out his link I'll do it again and I'll write a summary post on this tomorrow but follow him on Spreecast and you will hear him interview some of the most interesting people um, from lawyers to you know um, to speech you know speech writers to social media mavericks I mean absolutely amazing people that he has coming on and and so just to give you an idea he had Seth Gooden not only Seth Gooden, but he had Chris Brogan in the spreecast with Seth. So, I mean, that's the type of people that he has coming to these spreecasts. It's, it's absolutely incredible, the guests that he has, and obviously, you know, his insights. So please check him out there. Um, does anybody have any last thoughts, any, anything that they want to say before we sign off here? I think we should do this again. <laughs> I'm sure we will have Mitch on again. Um, we have some great guests coming up. Uh, next week is our <coughs> excuse me is our um, our uh, ugly. I don't know if we're calling it ugly. Our our Christmas uh, holiday party, whatever you want to call it, our mm. secret Santa gifts, everything else. So it's going to be a little bit joyous, a little bit fun. Um, you know, it'll be good conversation, but we'll have a little bit more fun than we usually do. And uh, and then I think we're going to take a break a week off. In, during the um, Christmas and New Year holiday and be back the first of, uh, of 2013 and have absolutely stellar lineup for 2013 um, ready to go. So <laughs> it's going to be awesome. And I am very happy to announce, um, mark it on your calendars, I should get it up this weekend, the Community Manager Unconference first edition of 2013 is going to be in New York City on February 23rd. 2013 so get your tickets to New York for that week that's also social media week in New York so you can kind of come for the whole week and have a lot of stuff going on yeah so uh, everybody thank you so much for coming and have a fantastic weekend happy Hanukkah everybody last and night to you too it was last night the last night or nights tonight's the last tonight's night the last night yes happy Hanukkah I'll see you all next week oh, oh. <laughs> Craig Chris. There he is, <laughs> our youngest viewer. <laughs> ah. Cute. All right, everybody, have a great afternoon. Happy Bye, everybody. Bye.